Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jacob Music. This is my first podcast. Uh, we're going to be covering, covering a variety of topics. Anything from pop music and celebrities to very important world political issues. And today, on our pilot episode that nobody will hear, is my good friend Elizabeth. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing well today. kind of tired, but I'm doing really well. Thank you. I know, because your life is so difficult. Elizabeth know, does a lot for me. She was very supportive. I had my last Spanish final of my college career, and Elizabeth helped me all the way through, and I couldn't have done it without her. So, Elizabeth, how has your week been? Tiring. I don't help you with everything. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it, though. I got a lot of cleaning done. I saw a humongous spider in my laundry room yesterday. Um, I slept. Kind of well, and I'm very energetic now, which is good. Well, that's great. That's good. And you've, yeah, you've you've had a lot going on this week. In addition to just helping me, you've been helping one of our good friends as well. You've basically been floating her through the course. <laughs> yes, but it's all worth it. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Yeah. More people now in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's great when you can uh, participate and when you can work in something that you love so much and you love Absolutely. the Spanish language. It's, it's, it's so much more gratifying and there's yeah. money does not do it for me. Either. And you know what, me and, and this friend, we really appreciate. I know that we appreciate. Whatever has happened, we appreciate what you've done for us. Absolutely, absolutely. I hope this friend felt the same way. So let's talk about something, our first issue of my podcast ever, which is something that kind of makes me feel like the world is perfect. So I'm going to ask you this question, because you know who Kaya is, right? Because Kaya is yes, like, yes, I do. yeah, like my favorite rapper, the, the famous artist who yes. has rapped the uh, UK top three hit, My Neck, My Back, which is, <laughs> if you guys have not heard this song, you need to, and you're about a decade late, because this is the best song. <laughs> Elizabeth, do you wanna do you wanna um, just give them a little sample of it? Can you recite the chorus to this song? Um, I'll help you. No, I'll help you. My back. Is that right? I'll help you. My neck. Okay, good. My back. My back. My like my pussy and my crack. Yeah. <laughs> no, you have to say <laughs> lick my. Oh, lick my. <laughs> I, I forgot. I forgot those two. Oh those my two god. Okay, we're going to do it again. I didn't even give you that much to memorize, but we're going to try it again, okay? Okay, my neck, my back. My back, lick my pussy and my crack. <laughs> you have such an uncertain cadence to it. Everybody recognizes that that song is the anthem of our generation. Yes. Well, among women it is, definitely. Absolutely. I mean, there should be more activities that Kaya describes. But anyway, it's a very female-centric song. Which is it is a nice. very yeah, absolutely, and that's what I love about these porn rappers. But anyways, so what do Miley Cyrus and Kaya have in common? Well, they had nothing in common up until today, <laughs> when I found out that Kaya will be the guest rapper on the remix of Miley Cyrus's great song "We Can't Stop." And I, I, I mean, when I read this, I. Like, just thinking about it now, I feel ecstatic. I feel loved by the universe, really. Um, Absolutely. This is going to be mind-blowing. And I know that you saw on Facebook, because I saw that you liked it, I posted the cover... <laughs> They, the record company didn't, did not even bother to make a cover for the remix, but just accepted one that a fan sent in. So this is how high-profile this is. And it looks like, if you haven't seen this, because you probably haven't because this is pretty new. Um, well, I know, I'm talking to our zero audience, so I forget that, but may as well practice. But the photo <laughs> looks like it's just their heads photoshopped onto bodies. <laughs> I know, it's so very special and fun. It looks really shoddy. But that's totally, but I feel like Miley Cyrus, I mean, she sought Kaya out. I feel like she understands Kaya's whole aesthetic, which is basically like, you know, ooh, I have a new album coming out. I'm going to put my hair into dreadlocks and bend over and mime doggy style while you take a picture of me. You know, like that's her, her whole look. So it's very funny. I can't wait 
for this to happen. I mean, I, I, I too. No, absolutely. I think that Kaya will get so much more popularity. Just yes. She'll be able to be influenced, and a new generation will be open to hearing about her, especially the Miley Cyrus generation. Yes. I mean, because the, I would say probably, I mean, I'm a huge Miley Cyrus fan, but I'd say I'm probably, we're both probably much older than most Miley Cyrus fans. So it would, this will be good in raising Kaya awareness. Exactly, exactly. It's a new generation. The new minds can open up. To Kaya's greatness. So this is nothing but good news. I thought it would be great if we would start out with great news. But I'm highly looking forward to that song. It's going to be good. And hopefully Kaya will get a little shot of popularity from this. And hopefully she'll be relevant to a new generation. Okay, so let's move on to Lindsay Lohan. Um, TMZ. Yes, TMZ. Um, you know, we were talking about this wonderful news organization today, is reporting about a comment that she made in a tweet about her movie from a few years ago. I think it was 2007. And the movie was called I Know Who Killed Me. Have you ever heard of this movie? Yes, we have that. My father bought it for the least. You actually have that movie? Yes, we do. My father bought it. I have not watched it all. Oh! I believe he didn't like it. So you have not seen the masterpiece? No, but it sounds fascinating. Well, I have not either, but I should have. I tried to. Um, I was in Florida during this movie's release, and I was in my grandparents' senior citizens community, which keeps movies about 10 months after they've left the theaters everywhere else. Because, you know, old people time goes much slower. Um, Absolutely. So, so we, my grandfather said, um, what movie do you want to go see? And I said, oh, my God, we have to go see the new Lindsay Lohan film, of course. And... I could not convince either of my grandparents to go see it with me. <laughs> so I ended up not seeing it. But the reason that this movie is relevant again today is, you know, as we were talking about earlier today, Lindsay Lohan's birthday was earlier today. So she was allowed from her rehab center called Cliffside Malibu, she was allowed to go onto her Twitter account and she tweeted, um, you know, a fan back, this fan had said, um, you know, in celebrating her birthday, Lindsay Lohan, can you please tweet me? I seriously watched I Know Who Killed Me twice last night. So you would think that Lindsay Lohan would, if she were to respond back, would be like, oh, that's so sweet. Instead, and this shows Lindsay Lohan has, it has a good sense of humor. Instead, her response was this. So he said, you know, I watched your movie twice. She said, Two times too many, exclamation point. <laughs> so, I mean, and you know that it's hilarious, and that movie does have a terrible reputation, but, you know... Self-deprecating humor in a bad movie is always nice. It's like when Halle Berry accepted yes. the award, I believe, for Catwoman. Yes, and you know what? Catwoman is a great movie. I don't know if you've seen that. I have a little bit of Austin, but Austin, I like the fact that Halle Berry, and I believe... Sandra Bullock, they both went to the Rousey's and accepted their awards in person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these. it's good to see that some celebrities don't take themselves too seriously. Yeah, I mean, they got a paycheck no matter what, so what's the uh, word, you know? Yeah, I know. What's the big deal? I think it's awesome, you know, and I love, I'll admit it, I love terrible movies. I love Lifetime movies. I love cheesy movies. Catwoman fit the bill 100%, you know? Yes. But this is not about her. Yeah, absolutely. This absolutely. is about Lindsay Lohan. So Lindsay Lohan, so short story, Lindsay Lohan has a sense of humor and her movie was terrible. Don't go watch it. <laughs> okay, absolutely. moving on to something. Okay, so we're, we're kind of jumping in the serious level here. But this is very important. Um, this is an article from Fox Business News, okay? This is dangerous. So they're reporting that PepsiCo's namesake soda, so that would be Pepsi, of course, still shows high levels of a carcinogen in 10 U.S. states. So this carcinogen is called 4-MEI, which stands for 4 methyl So in that, this, this uh, substance was in the soda, and it was anywhere from 4 to more than 8 times higher than California safety levels require in 10 states. Um, this is coming from the Center of Environmental Health. So Pepsi has responded uh, by saying that this carcinogen comes from its caramel coloring that it gets from suppliers. But, you know, these guidelines were issued before, but Pepsi said it could not 
um, live up or reach up to these guidelines because it was too hard for their suppliers to comply with these standards nationwide. So and it goes on to say the chemical in question is a byproduct of industrial production of caramel coloring. So it's basically a toxic byproduct and, and was found to have clear evidence of carcinogen, car, carcinogen like that. Carcinogenicity. So I probably sound really yeah. stupid. But uh, last year, by the National Toxicology Program um, on an, you know animal studies, I don't support animal studies. But then again, you know what? We are all living organisms, and if this is showing to be toxic, um, and it's it's up to eight times higher than than uh, the Cal the state of California has found safe. That's worrying. So of course, shares of Pepsi have have fallen. Uh, 1.2 percent today. So, w w does this alarm you? What do you think about this? I do not support anything that has carcinogens in it because they're cancer causing. Just like I do not go tanning because they're, they're carcinogenic causing chemicals. Yes, within that, the tanning bed. And it makes total um, sense. Do I you... had no idea that something that we were drinking had anything yeah. in that had, were, that had carcinogens, but. I suppose there's a reason why I don't drink a lot of soft drinks, and I try to I drink yes. to our tea. And it's so much better, but I will tell you recently, I have been, you know, in the winter I tend to drink a lot of tea, tons of tea. But as it gets hotter outside, I'm less drawn to hot tea, um, so I have been drinking tons of soft drinks. And unfortunately, I've been drinking Pepsi, wild cherry Pepsi a lot, and this worries me. I mean, uh, do you drink Pepsi? No, my family's a Coke family, and honestly, those, the, co the, the, the competition or the competitive vibe between Coke and Pepsi is strong. There are people that are just as loyal to either brand. Like, my father would only drink Coke. He would yeah. not drink Pepsi. Yeah, yes. But there's good um, news for you I because... I drink brisk tea. I don't know what brand brisk iced tea is, but I drink that. Yeah, Brisk is, I'm pretty sure that's made by PepsiCo, but it. But this article is only saying that it was found in Pepsi, period. So, I don't know about Brisk. I mean, it's a possibility, but there is good news for you, and that is that this report states that, you know, Coke has completely complied and removed the carcinogens from their soda. That's awesome. I'm really excited about that. That's great. It's, that, it's great that actually people put... The health, consumers' health above the dollar. Yeah, but it makes me question why is this? Why Pepsi cannot do this then? I don't know. I mean, business. I mean, I don't pertain to know of the the business decisions of executives, soda, yes. soda executives. We can only guess. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's not something. That, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm not that selfish. Yeah. Um, it, it might be that it costs more to remove it or to find a substitute. Perhaps it's like a sweetener in the drink so that yeah. it's kind of to, to um, replace it. Yes. Or uh, they feel like it would change or that it would change um, the taste of the, of the product. I don't know. I mean, yes. it, people have a variety of rational relations. Well, I'm going to like removing something or changing mm -hmm. some formula mm -hmm. that it's so hard to change it because we've always had an existence and secret. Mm -hmm. And if we change it, we have to think of something else. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't pretend to know, but I'm happy that COVID already complied because that makes me more happier to drink Coke. Like if I do choose a tissue box, I will drink a Coke before Pepsi because it's what's available in my house. Well, and I think that it needs to be said that you know our school, UMBC in Maryland, is a Pepsi school. They sell Pepsi products everywhere, and I have drank so much more Pepsi just since I started to go to UMBC. I mean, this is kind of worrying, and I hope that our administration is paying attention, maybe, because, I mean, this is important, you know? No, absolutely. Um, that's the hardest thing when universities or high schoolers, when they have an agreement Yes. Um, between a certain company is that, like, uh, I remember I was reading a book called Bastard Nation, and it mentioned the agreements that high schoolers have to promote certain products and how the companies will literally invest in invest in certain high schools and give them all this money and um, just improve the quality of the schools due to the due to sponsorships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like names or products or exclusively selling the rights mm -hmm. to certain things. And it's horrible but it's part of capitalism. You you have to criticize the system, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm hmm Yes. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it all goes back to structural factors, the factors of the economy, the factors of, you know, the realities of corporate America and what their values are. And unfortunately, um, and I, I think in the end, the losers will be them too. I mean, eventually, um, won't Pepsi just be forced to change? I don't know. I mean, I feel like a lot of, it needs, there needs to be more publicity, there needs to be more media activism. I don't think people will care unless, unfortunately, unless it's splashed across the news. Yeah, and that's the thing. Is, they you need know, like a public shaming to change. Yes, they do. Things like, honestly, they, I don't think if things with um, Paula Dean did not come up to light, I don't think she would have changed and apologized and lost her endorsement. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think it's total, but I think a public shaming needs to be done when people change their attitudes or to look out for the public interest because otherwise no one will care. You have to have more than one person care. You have to actually have an honest, like a really deep focus, a a media blitz, pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. You have to, you know, you have to, you have to involve the media. You have to involve many people. Yeah. Because one person, unfortunately, cannot change everything. Yeah. Unless you would like to believe that. And even activists who use, you know, more fringe media or, or activist media like Democracy Now! or like independent... Yeah, absolutely. I think when fringe media catches it, that's when me- mainstream media wants a piece of it. And yeah. What facilitates it is a folks with mainstream media, but you have mm-hmm. to get their attention, and that's the hardest thing. That there's so yeah. many things that the mainstream media wants to focus on that you need to make this a big deal. Like, you need to... You know, you need to contact as many people as possible. You need to talk about it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, but it's it's a shame that, unfortunately, it seems like only business media, like niche media, is picking this up. I have, you know, m- both me and you are news junkies, but I have seen no mention of this in sort of um, mainstream news sources in terms of ones that are no, not oriented no, so towards this business. Is the, yeah, this is the first time I've heard of it. Yeah, and, and you know, oddly enough, it's coming through Fox Business Network, which is very pro-corporate. Um, you know, although CNBC is giving them a run for their money these days, but, you know, th- obviously they're unabashedly pro-capitalism. So it's interesting that it's so serious, and, you know, the journalists there are so worried about it that even they write about it, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that, I think that there needs more attention, but unfortunately, there's a structure of how media works. You, people need to get whatever topic that they're really interested in that, yeah. that disconcerning to the mainstream media. Unfortunately, you cannot just rely on small niche, niche, um, you know. Yeah, and those are great, and it's yeah. good to to rely on them for information. But the thing is, if you're going to affect change and get the big word out there, unfortunately, you have to go through a, a limited number of channels. Absolutely, you need to, you know, you need to get context. You need it's not just word of mouth. You need word of mouth, and you need you need to know a lot of people. Yeah, you do. You need connections, which you know. Yeah, you need connections. You need to know the right the right people, though, actually, not just not as many people for the right people to yeah, get you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know and you know that we were talking about this earlier. You know, you have to look attractive. So they'll want to put you on cable news, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and I, I'm thinking unfortunately it might take somebody unfortunately getting cancer and maybe, you know, even passing away for this to get attention. But you know what, if somebody got, you know, drank Pepsi every day, you know, say theoretically, and she's like this beautiful blonde bombshell with huge, gigantic breasts, and, you know, she gets cancer, and she can fairly conclusively, I don't know how you could, but say theoretically she could tie it to Pepsi, um, you know, I'm sure that she would be on Anderson Cooper, she would be on Fox News, you know, she would be on Morning Joe, she would be all Absolutely. over the place. Appearances matter in this respect. Someone who's attractive will get more attention than someone who's just, like, obese and, like, has been drinking Pepsi for all their lives. Because people will automatically be like, that's why you die. Yeah, you well, they, and they could... You're 200 pounds. Yes, and, and if somebody... And yeah, yeah, and if somebody's obese, they could just say, well, you're just fat, that's why you died, you know, and... Right. No, no, a blonde bombshell who is maintained her size two figure and weighs 110 pounds and mm-hmm. double deep breasts. Yeah, mm-hmm. she will get the attention and yeah. she'll be on all the news. She will be talked about on all the cable news networks. Yeah, and, and not to say that that's good or that's bad, but unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on if you benefit from this, you know, that is the reality of the media, especially the visual media. I mean, this is television, you know? I mean, it it's all about appearances, graphics, you know? 
The person who goes to this cable news for information exclusively is not necessarily looking for the most the most dense, packed information. You know, they're looking for an entertaining time. Um, so, you know, that's a very complicated issue. It's very interesting. Um, but let's move on to something even more incendiary. Um, so Rush Limbaugh, um, you know, says a lot of interesting things <laughs> in his day-to-day uh, -day existence as a, um, a radio show host. Um, let me find where this is. But does your dad, does he listen to Rush Limbaugh or am I getting that wrong? I don't know. He has told me that he has in the past agreed on him at some point, but that he's still like a pill pusher, a pill popper. A pill popper. Well, I mean, yeah, he, he Rush Limbaugh has struggled. It was very well publicized. Well, um, I don't know if my father actually actively listens to him. Bill Maher yeah. is one thing. Yes, I, I know that. But Rush Limbaugh, I'm not sure about. I have to let you know. Yeah. Well, I don't know, but it would be interesting um, to hear about that because I know that your dad is open about speaking about a variety of, of issues, even if they're controversial. But so Rush Limbaugh yeah, totally. this yeah, morning, <laughs> so this morning Rush Limbaugh was talking about Egypt, and I guess maybe he was trying to make a joke, but he said, uh, you know, they, meaning you know, I guess his sources, whatever they are. Um, they cannot confirm the coup in Egypt has taken place. And then he was like, dot, dot, dot. He waited a little while. And he said, only the coup here has been confirmed. And then he waited a little longer. And he said, here, it's the Democrat Party coup. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't even know what this is supposed to mean. Because number one, he, as, as many conservatives on the, in the media do, he gets the name of the party wrong. It's not the Democrat Party. It's the Democratic Party. Which I don't I don't know what it is, but I mean it's very common to to say that here in my area that is very conservative as well. But I, I mean I guess he was meaning you know well Barack Obama is still at the president, so I guess that's a coup. But it's kind of I don't know. I just feel like really it wasn't funny and it didn't really make sense. But then again, it's outrageous enough that I'm talking about it, so you know. <laughs> I mean, it was Russell Limbaugh. I feel like he said certain things to get the attention. He gets a lot of radio view, um, viewers who agree with him. Yeah. I listen to him, so I just try to talk, talk, uh, turn down, turn out his nonsense or whatever he says. Yeah, because you know pretty much it's going to be <laughs> offensive to our sensibilities, you know? I know, absolutely. And trying to rationalize him is just going to make my head hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we will not even do that. But I will say one more funny thing that Rush stuck in at the end of this segment. You know, he, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, Rush Limbaugh show, number one radio show, blah, blah, blah. And then he said something before they went to commercial break that was bizarre. He said these five words, Limbaugh Institute Advanced Conservative Studies. So I don't know if he has some sort of online university or he has like a think tank or he thinks that the, he does. Well, when Jerry Fowler has, has his own university, I wouldn't be surprised that um, Limbaugh has a, like, a own conservative institute. Does it? Because um, I think that he's like the only conservative institute. Does it? Um, I went to it. David Horowitz has his own institute, too. He does? I'm, I don't know. you, do you know? Oh, I actually don't. I, I rarely, if ever, read anything about David Horowitz. I couldn't even tell you three facts about him. Okay, you don't have to. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But, you know, I just think it's really funny that... Apparently, he, there is something in existence that is called the Limbaugh Institute Advanced Conservative Studies. I don't know what that is. I don't even know what Advanced Conservative Studies is. I don't know what Advanced Conservative Studies is. I guess it's conservative thought, maybe a study of Ayn Rand. And I don't know how that's different like, from like, just... Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, mean, I don't know how that's... Everything. Yeah, I don't know how that's different from just normal conservative studies, but whatever it is, it's really funny <laughs> because he really <laughs> sounded really convinced that he... Um, he is a representation of advanced studies of anything. That's pretty remarkable. <laughs> okay, so moving on now. Um, so let's talk about the Catholic Church, one of my favorite topics. I know we've, we've, we talk about it quite often. You know, number one, because I come from a Catholic background. I know the inside story. Obviously, I'm not wit witnessing priest abuse, but I, I know the culture. And, you know, and, and you're interested in it because of your interest in Latin America specifically, you know, and the Catholic Church affects Absolutely. their lives. But here's what I got from Link TV World News. 
Um, so the latest, you know, I mean, in the past two decades, it seems every month or every other month, there is another um, diocese, which is the Catholic um, units, like it would be the equivalent to the secular district. So these are basically Catholic districts. So uh, it seems there's a new district in the in the news every month or every other month because uh, priest abuses of uh, sexually of children is coming to the surface. And this time today, it's in Milwaukee. So six thousand pages of documents um, that the the church had recorded. Um, have been released. I don't know if the church re released them. I don't know if they were just released by some sort of whistleblower. But it does reveal the story which we have found to be the standard tale from the heartland of America all the way to Ireland, you know, and the world, which is priests are found to be abusing children sexually because parents come forward and, and talk about it. They complain about it, and very rightly so. But while they should be going to the police, unfortunately, you know, religion as a system inculcates group, um, group mentality, but also group loyalty. So the first thing they go to is the priests. You know, they go to the source of this. And so the diocese catches hold um, and, and finds out about this and then just moves the priest from parish to parish or diocese to diocese. So they're just moved around the country. They get no repercussions. Some of these people, it has gone on since the 60s and 70s, and they have not been brought to justice. And I'm not even worried, well, I'm not even worried about them being punished. What I'm worried about is, number one, the concerns of the abused were never validated by this institution that broke their trust so much. But also, you know, it's kind of shocking that the parents would not go to the police first, but because, you know, if they did go to the police, you know, this issue would be taken care of. But instead, they went to the diocese, and the priests were just moved around, and they, it was covered up, you know? So in this 6,000 pages that was released on the My, uh, Milwaukee diocese, there are files on 40 priests. So this reveals something particularly tragic and jarring. Um, it details the abuse of 200 deaf boys who were molested by one priest. Deaf? One priest molested 200 boys who were deaf and potentially could not communicate what was going on. That I'm is... That's, that's, that's horrific. That's horrific. I mean, that is that's, unconscionable. That is, that's as horrible as molesting someone who is... Um, mentally incapacitated. Yeah. Um, obviously, um, because they cannot consent to it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is just, oh God. I mean, as a non Catholic, you know, we've been hearing about this stuff our entire conscious lives. What is this? How does this change your view of the Catholic Church? Or actually, if it's been here all along, how has this molded I think your it view? It makes me very, I, I mean, I will tell you this from personal experience, obviously. It makes me dislike religion, organized religion, a lot more. Yeah. It shows the hypocrisy of people that pretend to be so devout, and then you see the true colors later on. What are, I feel like the more devout you try to be, the more hypocritical you are behind closed doors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... And, and, you know, and so the, the little news clip went on to talk about these different uh, cycles of abuse. And the cycles of abuse are the same whether it's in a family or whether it's in an institution like this. And, you know, they get moved, they do it again. They get moved, they do it again. And, you know, the, the church would come out and say, well, um, you know, once they were caught that what they would do in between moving them is they would, quote, send them to treatment. But the church did not elucidate what that would be at least in this news clip. And I just wonder, I wonder, is that some sort of faith-based counseling? Because that, it just doesn't stand up to the rigors of, of science, unfortunately. And our criminal law system is based on science. So I'm not criticizing that, if that's what it is. But I, I, I mean, we don't know what treatment is going. I don't even know what treatment would work. I mean, I've heard that there's no treatment that works. I don't know. I mean, for me, honestly... I remember when I heard about um, sex offenders who were truly offended, especially the offended, um, they would violate young children. Um, the one thing that I remember the, that they eventually did in prison was um, chemical castration. Oh my God. Do they still do that? Um, in Korea, they do. They did this for like, one person. I believe he was accused of repeatedly mm -hmm. molesting young children. They, uh, they chemically castrated him. Wow. 
That's interesting. And I'm sure Saudi Arabia... Well, actually, no, because men get away with everything in Saudi Arabia, so never mind. But, (laughs) you know, so I'm not even going to talk... I'm not even going to conjecture because we know all about Saudi Arabia. But this isn't Saudi Arabia, guys. This is the United States of America. And this is Middle America, supposedly the haven of the Bible Belt, of Christian and American morality. But, you know what? This is just showing that, you know, what appears on the surface of an institution is not always what it seems like. But at this point, I mean, who is the Catholic Church kidding? I mean, it's just bizarre that more people don't leave the church to see that it's rotten to the core. And you know what? I, go ahead. Yeah, I thought there's some think that, oh, well, there, I mean, in the Christian theology, Muslim theology, it's offering all sense, no matter how great, we're all sinners, therefore we should just accept that and just sinner. Yeah. Um, obviously there are different gradations of sin. Yes. Can't say speak specifically of them. However, I mean, I'm more disillusioned now with the amount of hypocrisy yes. that goes around. Yes. The amount of hypocrisy of do what I say, not as I do, and I'm so religious, and yet I do all the things that are supposedly banned yeah. from my religion. Yeah. Yeah. And you so know what? Again, I come from a Catholic background, and I cannot tell you why. Why the people that I know and have known why they do, they're not outraged by this. I don't understand it. They're not. But these are the first people, you know, these days, it, you know, it's very typical to be Catholic and conservative. It did not used to be because, you know, back in the day, um, Catholics were part of a very large liberal coalition that supported FDR because they were seen as a minority. They were persecuted. But now that they're brought into the tent of white American privilege, um, you know, Catholicism and Catholics see themselves as mainstream, but these are the, you know, they're now conservative, a lot of them. So they're the first people to jump on these family values bandwagons, the first people to criticize, you know, um, you know, celebrities or other people for their sexual behavior, the first to criticize homosexuality. So it is mystifying to me why Catholics and Catholic families and Catholic parents don't see a problem in this. I don't know. I mean, I can't understand the mentality of most of that religious thing about I stopped trying to understand because I cannot rationalize it. It's not and logical. It but then again, I at the end of the day, re- religion is not. But when you're, t- you know, and that's well, fine. You know, yeah, exactly. But that's the point: is that you cannot apply logic to this. Yeah, you can apply logic to this. And you know what? It's fine for religion to be, you know, in, you know, so instead of science, it's, you know, spiritual science or whatever. That's fine. But when we're talking about people being hurt, children's rights being taken away, and violation, you know, that is when things get serious and you need to be logical, you know? So. Absolutely. You know, but Absolutely. I. And let, me, right. let me ask the toughest question here. And I'll be curious to see your thoughts. Because it's one thing to talk about these individual incidents. And, and the media does like individual incidents because it can attach characters. But that's not how I function here. You know, that's not how I like to think. Let's look at the institutional level. It's not just a few individuals. This is hundreds and hundreds of priests over the past two to three decades who have been found out to be engaging in this type of behavior. So I have to ask you, what is the factor that ties these people together, what is the factor that is present in the Catholic Church, it, it, whether it's, it's, it's theology or it's culture, that, that breeds this? Why, why is this present in Catholicism so prominently? I would say, why is there so much hypocrisy in religion in general? I don't think it's just a person to Catholicism. I feel like you would find, I feel like it's, pre- it's, it's, um, it's in the news and um, it's found out a lot more politically in Catholicism, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's not only in other branches of Christianity, but in other religions too. I absolutely agree with you, but I, I think most people would con- um, agree with me here that, okay, yeah, I mean, this abuse of power has always happened in every religious tradition that's codified and, you know, gained political power, but yada, yada, whatever. But, okay, this is happening in the Catholic Church a lot more than it's happening in, say, oh, Buddhism or something, you know? I mean, so... I, I, no, 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 no Buddhism, but like, it's like Islam or Judaism. Yeah, but like, even, you know, but even, but you do not, but at least me personally, I have not 
heard of, you know, Lutheran sex abuse scandals with children, Methodists. I've not heard, you know, Calvinist. I've not heard it from the Mormons, you know. So, I mean, what, there, there has to be something particular no, about no, this. I mean, you want to find out mental informants, you can consider the marriage, you know, like one. Yeah, like, you're right, the yeah, FLDS. No, as a problem. Yeah, but, but you know what, it's a little bit of a different context, because, you know, the FLDS. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I don't know, I mean, honestly, I'm not a Catholic. I don't know Catholic doctrine or wherever they can get a justification from. I feel like it's, uh, maybe the effect of it is because the priests are meant to be celibate, so they cannot release, they, have, they are sexually oppressed. Yeah. So, I mean, we I were, think, you know, we I talk. Think I think it's a consequence of, of celibacy. Yes. And this is why some Catholic priests have asked to change doctrine and ask to have marriage. Yes. And why some of them leave to go to other um, denominations, like Episcopalian or Lutheran. Yeah, that's true. And um, you know, feeling sexual desire, you know, that's normal. That's part of human, that's yeah. human, that's part of human, what a human being is. However, not being able to express it, I suppose, leads to deviance. I, t I could not have said it better than you did. And I think that's the core oh, of it. Thank you. I can't explain it either. Even coming from a Catholic background, I don't understand it. But you know what? What's because pedophilia, or you know, we call it that nowadays. But you know, whatever you you put a name on this act, the you know, the sexual abuse of children, you know, has been present forever in many different contexts. Whatever. However, what is more enraging to me is the fact that I am not seeing um, questioning and outrage from the Catholic community, from the Catholic parents that I know, as I feel like it should be. I mean, these people are outraged about Barack Obama when he just drops an, a, you know, something that they find untenable into a speech. Yet how many children does it take to be violated before they start to question, should we put our time and our money into this organization. I mean, but that's a question neither of us can answer. You know, we can't attest to them. I mean, I'm not, like I said, I'm not, I can only, I can only be accountable towards my actions. I cannot be accountable towards the actions of others. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, you know, how about questions you're asking me? I honestly do not know. Yeah, well, I mean, they're tough questions, but it's because I believe that you can handle them. <laughs> you oh, know. absolutely. I believe, I know I can. Yeah, I'm not going to have just, sure. uh, just Joe Blow on this show, because it's all about critical thinking. But So let's move on to another extremely interesting topic. So I, was, I got this from a Psychology Today blog post, and it's called Altered Magazine Photos Hurt Our Self-Image. So it's about unrealistic portrayals of women in media. You know, a very fertile topic for discussion. You know, us as, you know, social scientists, both me and you, even though we're in different fields, you know, we're, 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 in, we're cultural scientists. You know, we, we've talked about this a lot, both in school, out of school. It, it is one of our primary concerns, I think. And, you know, in talking with my friends that are media aware or that are females and feel affected by this, they definitely see this as one of the preeminent issues of our time. So let me read some quotes from this story. So in this blog post, the uh, doctor who wrote this, Camille Johnson, PhD, uh, from San Jose State University, um, uh, talks about, again, like I said, the unrealistic images of women, how they have been edited, altered, and digitally finessed to remove blemishes, inches, and pounds. Um, so... One solution that she talks about, and this is very innovative, and I thought it was an interesting solution. Some people have suggested that magazines and advertisers should include disclaimers uh, with photos indicating which have been altered and which have been um, photoshopped and providing details about what has been altered. And you would think that that would... Um, negate some of the negative self-esteem effects that women see or women experience when these are, um, these are consumed as media images. You would think, and I was thinking, I was like, wow, this is a great idea. I've never actually heard of this before. However, and this is bizarre, but these disclaimers actually had the opposite effect. When ads are included with a disclaimer, women reported that the pictures were more relevant to their sense of self. Um, so when there was more text informing them that the photo had been altered, they were more likely to feel that the models in the advertisement were relevant with their own appearance. So basically, when you state on an ad 
and you make it clear that something has been photoshopped, something is unreal, something is a falsehood, or it's a construction, um, women are more, more likely to allow it to affect their sense of self. I, this is bizarre. I mean, what do you think is behind this? I actually have no idea. I mean, I don't, it's weird, because I don't, so many women are so different. The psychology of women is very fascinating. I want you to take a course in psychology of women, because I find that some things that affect me don't affect my friends, and some things that affect my friends don't affect me either. I, I feel like the idea of self-esteem and the female mind, the female psyche, is such a complex topic. Yes. Yes. I feel like women, especially, but I feel like it's so much, it's societally taught that women should connect so much of our image yes. to our self esteem. Yes. No, it's been corrosive. I, I've had to learn to not place so much emphasis on my looks, which is why I try to rebuff any advances by my family mm-hmm. um, to make me more feminine, yes. as if I need to be more feminine, because it's just not my style, and I don't want to be gender normative yes. in any way. But, but you have received, and let it be said, that you have received a lot of criticism for that. And you've received a lot of flack. I mean, one of my, but also, you know, I've seen this in other people. My best friend, Patty, just because she presents herself a certain way in behavior and in dress, you know, her relatives are convinced that for whatever reason, she's a lesbian and she's hiding it and lying to them. Even though she says, no, I'm not a lesbian. Just because she doesn't conform to this this image that that um, they expect of women, she's labeled a lesbian. Absolutely no. I think in this society there are a certain expectations of what a, a female should look like, act like. There, I mean, societal expectations of, of gender norms and gender of hetero norms. It, it's very corrosive to a female identity. Yeah. It, it, it ties a female identity to the man. To the, it was it was in this heterosexual paradigm. Yeah. To a female should act feminine to attract men to gain the attention of men to keep the attention of men. A man is not going to want a masculine female. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And that's that's unfortunate. But you know, our sexualities and our desires, what we fetishize, all of that is constructed socially. It's a very complicated interplay between our personalities and our environment. And, you know, they kind of co-create each other. And for whatever reason, we end up with this certain type of standard for feminine beauty that we do have today, which, you know, it's not as bad as it was in 1996 through 2003, when that was really the heroin chic era. I feel like women should embrace their curve. Yeah. Been, whatever they have, women should embrace it. Breasts, no breasts, big, big ass, no ass at all. I mean, small waist, bigger waist. I think there, I mean, for all the heterosexual women out there, there are men out there for you. There are men, of course, there are men that fetishize with certain types of women, but there are men who will appreciate you. There are females that will appreciate you. Yes. I mean, I feel like people should need to break out of what the media tells us. Yes. And stop living up to this societal ideal because you cannot do that. There's there's a reason why there's there's this issue of eating disorders before women get married. Yeah. There's a reason why women do not want to get pregnant because they don't want to gain weight. All these issues are problematic. And I think women need to get outside of themselves and, like, focus on their own happiness. They should not depend, they should not have their happiness depend on someone else, particularly a man. Yes, yes. I've never, I've never liked that, and I've always fought against the idea of that. I need to have a man to make me happy in life. Have you felt that pressure to attach yourself? Absolutely, especially recently, when the fact that I'm to be 25 in a month, and people have asked me, professors, friends, yeah. um, guys that are interested in me, my own family, they, once they find out that I'm single, they ask me why, and yeah. then... Why are you single? Yeah. Like, either it's not, not that there's anything wrong with me, but that I'm, a, I'm an attractive, intelligent young woman mm-hmm. who should be with someone. Yes. I'm not. So there must be something wrong. And it was offensive that I can't be single and be, help, and be happy. Or that I, can, I want to wait to find someone. Yeah. I, it's almost like they're devaluing you. Because you Absolutely. don't have some sort of conjugate part for yourself. You know, just because you don't have an equal who's a male, you know, you're suddenly not seen as whole. And that's wrong. And if they knew you, and your family should know you, but if they truly knew and understood you as a person, they would know 
that you're not missing anything. Absolutely, but I think that it should have people, they accept whatever the society tells them, and what society is acceptable is a young woman in her 20s in a committed a long-term relationship possibly leading to marriage and children, but she is with someone. They're a single woman um, who is attractive, who is young, who is intelligent. Should have someone, you know. They should yeah. not be single. She should not be single. Yeah. And I've never understood, and it's always annoyed me when I've had several guys tell me, why are you single? Because I don't know how to answer that question, to be honest, because that's not a question that I would have asked a guy. It's not the first thing I asked someone when I said, hello, how are you, what's your name, yeah. why are you yeah, that's bizarre. You have why are you single? That's so weird. And but it's like that question is so disturbing. Well, it's not like something you plan. Right, absolutely. But people are aware of that. People are trying to operate within their own societal and cultural norms. Yeah. And from from what they know. Yeah. Um I mean, unfortunately if people don't fit into what people consider normal, they it's deviant. Yeah. That's what deviance is, it's um a, something outside of the social norm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's unfortunate, but, yeah, I mean, I learned to just accept it and not think about it too much. Um, I never, I never, I mean, I give them an answer to people, but, I mean, it's my personal business, and honestly, I don't have the right to defend myself, even though sort of that you feel defensive, like, I, should, I feel like I'm being blamed, mm-hmm. even though nothing's my fault. It's what they think, like, I'm not going to care about what they think. So... Yeah. So let's go back to body image. Think back to maybe when you were at a more sensitive time, maybe, you know, your early teens. And I, I think Absolutely. your your experience would be different because you, you know, you're, you are a female in this society. So it is interesting to get your insight when you were, say, 12, 13, 14. You were seeing what were invariably photoshopped images. And that was at the height of this, of, of right. heroin chic. What was your experience like? What images did you see, and did they stick with you, and did they change your thinking and view of yourself? Absolutely. Um, I grew up with the images, especially being mixed, being half Korean. Yes. I grew up with the images of women who were blonde hair, blue eyed, had bigger breasts, small waist, a flat stomach, um, um, uh, nice legs. You know, and a very petite. And mm-hmm. for the longest time, I wanted to be blonde hair and blue eyed, um, or a brunette and blue eyed, but pretty yeah. much white, um, yeah. you know, typically speaking. And I was really frustrated being mixed because although my school was, um, my middle school was, uh, was quite diverse, I thought this was what men wanted. And that's what I saw on TV, that's what I saw on magazines, because I didn't see images of myself. I saw images of a stereotypical American woman. Yeah. And for the longest time, it, made me, it did make me feel very insecure that. I could not fit into what a guy would want. And so I would get very frustrated because I was like, I look like this. Yeah. Um, and then when I actually got into puberty and I started developing chicken curves, I didn't really like my body at that time either because when you're taught when you're younger that um, sexuality is something that should be controlled and repressed. Yes. It proved the sign of your sexuality. And it was very difficult for me to handle. And I spent a lot of my adolescence, until recently, a lot of my early 20s, covering my body, not wearing shorts, not wearing low cut tops, and trying to be very, being very sensitive. I yes, that's true. I did not true. attract a lot of male attention because I didn't show my body off, not that I wanted guys to know it's filling my brain, just because I felt secure that I was becoming a woman. I had, didn't have any idea how to deal with it. Yeah, and that's a problem for probably every girl in this society. But, so let's get more specific. What, in terms of um, damaging um, images of female bodies. Are there certain publications or girls magazines or sources that you think were particularly egregious and harmful during your puberty period? I think any young female women's magazine, 17, most specifically, I suppose, um, um, 17, um, W magazine, where they have the traditional fashion models. Yeah. Who are five zeros, who are very tall, like five ten, five eleven. Yeah. Who are probably the very willy big frames, but and then can like, just they can like wear whatever they want. I mean, when you when you grow up with that expectation of you're pretty much a statuesque figure, um, aside from the fact that you don't really have any curves up there, like they're very small frames. Um, it makes you feel like kind of weird. Like I have, I'm not like as proportionate as them. I'm not just a ruler. 
I have yeah. some, you know, I have some cellulite. I have some. Yeah. But not just up and down. It's got some, like, waves to it. It's got some definition to yeah. it. And until you do something insecure, you have to, like, make friends with other people. And you have to go look at real women in other places who are unashamed of their bodies. Yes. It's really hard to find because most women who post their fixed picture online um, are confident in their looks because they are attractive. You don't see the average um, plain Jane, I guess. Yeah. And really, attractive, we have yeah. to remember that that's very relative. Attractive literally means, you know, what other people find desirable. So whether you're attractive or not is not based on some no, absolutely. quality I mean, inborn. But it's but it's in a certain context. To you. Yes. What draws someone to you? Yes. Specifically. Because they're, it's coded in that society that that's attractive. But um, I'm just going to ask absolutely. you... Absolutely. We, we, um, we talked recently about... The fourth reading in Mauritania. Yeah. Um, because um, being because it, there's so much poverty and there's a lack of food available that yes. the yes. women see their daughters because of their, being obese is yes. considered healthy. Mm -hmm. Even though in our society in general, uh, health, statistically speaking, being obese is unhealthy and dangerous for your health yeah. for long term longevity. And that's that's a whole nother story that we could talk about another hour for. That's bizarre. But um, absolutely. But what what did I got, want to say here? Um, um, going back to body image, so bringing it back to this bizarre study. Um, do you have any theory? Do you have any theories as to why? I mean, because, and I'm just asking you, not because I think that you represent the female opinion, but because you've been in these girls' shoes. You know, if you looked at an ad and it said a disclaimer there that this was edited, what, I mean, would that make you more um, observant of the messages in the ad? Absolutely. If I hear it edited, I don't trust in its veracity. What, it can be telling me anything. I want an authentic looking representation of what a woman is, for example. Yeah, absolutely. But I don't like the photoshops because some photoshops are absolutely horrible. Yeah. They make a, they shave off so much of a woman's body that she no longer represents what the archetype of a female form is. Yeah. Yes. It gets very Barbie, to be honest, as far as body represents the unrealistic standards. It's very what? Very unrealistic standard. Yes, absolutely. So, okay, so let's wrap up. I have one more thing to ask you about this topic. You know, if, you know, what would you say to girls who were 12, 13, 14, 15, looking at Glamour magazine, um, seeing these images, and, and, and allowing it to affect their self-image? At 12 years old, you should not be reading Glamour magazine. You should be going out, playing sports, Words like eating healthy, enjoying time with your friends, and not stressing about fashion. You are too young to be worrying about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, it's, you're, you know, it's poisoning youth at a younger age, especially young girls. Girls should not worry about body image at so young. You're, that's the point of time to when you grow into adolescence, grow into puberty. And this is the time where you're questioning the most. And I definitely would tell them to put it down, find an actual book to read, and yeah. do other things. Yeah. Your time. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, here's the next topic, and this is, this is shocking. You know, it's really important to me to not just, you know, my favorite news organizations come from outside the United States because they offer a perspective that I feel is more desirable, but it would be a folly to limit myself to just those. You know, news from commercial sources as well, even sources I don't even trust because it's important to have that mix and that diversity and that eclecticism as well. Um, and, you know, including conservative news sources. You know, you know I will disclose, I am, I am on the left side of the spectrum, and I am f really far, you know. But at the same time, um, that does not stop me from conceding that conservative critics have a point. And I think with this story that they do have a point. I found this on twitchy.com. Which, do you know who Michelle Malkin is? Absolutely. I used to read her site when I was, like, in my late, early, early 20s and mid-late teens. <laughs> late, um, late teens as far as, like, being 18 or 19. Yeah. So, well, that's interesting. So we'll have to talk about that after we talk about this. But, so Michelle Malkin, um, I think fairly recently started this new website called Twitchy, which aggregates 
um, a lot of the buzz stories that are being retweeted by um, conservatives on Twitter, and she kind of aggregates them, and then instead of really writing a story, she just kind of shows everyone's tweets. And so, uh, so I did, yeah, I did that was yeah, so Twitchy's pretty interesting, actually. Um, so it, it's certainly very new media, you know. Um, but this is horrific, and it, it, in this situation that I'm about to describe, it's not really the tweets of of just people who that's interesting. It's actually what was tweeted originally, I guess, in the twit pick that started this. So let me describe this scene to you. Um, it shows four people. Three of them are children. One of them is the presumably the mother. They're protesting. They have placards. And they are protesting for pro-choice. So obviously, just right, you know, in terms of abortion rights. So obviously, just that image of children protesting for abortion rights is probably something that you would never expect to see. But that's not really the incendiary part, really, because it gets worse. There are two uh, types of placards that this group, I guess a family, has. One of them says, every child... Uh, you know, a wanted child, which that's not, um, that is not um, controversial. But what is controversial is the mother is holding a sign that says this. If I wanted government in my womb, I would fuck a senator. Not only that, the child is holding this sign as well. That's, I don't even know where to begin. So obviously Twitchy was not very happy about this being a, a conservative um, pro-life, as they say, organization, um, and it says that they're, ex you know, this mother is in the protesters are exploiting this children. Okay, so what do you think about this? I think it's a horrible thing to bring your children into. Don't bring your children into your top political beliefs, please. I completely agree. I, I think, especially at such a young age, if they're really, really young, no 10-year-old or 8-year-old no, please don't. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you, I've seen this picture. It's just indoctrination, in my opinion. It just sounds like indoctrination. Yeah, absolutely. And no matter what the beliefs are, whether those are fascist, yeah, Christian, just, liberal, conservative, children, communist I want ideas. I to develop yeah. their own beliefs apart from my own. I don't want them to be influenced by me. But you we know what? Talk, but I don't I, want them to be influenced by me. They can, yes. We can talk about, they can ask me my, uh, my beliefs, but I would never try to impose whatever I believe on them. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. But the thing is, I think it's the predominant school of parenting in, I can only speak for this country, but I would probably say the world as well. I think we are behind some European countries, but I think this is basically the standard. You know, parents um, view themselves as having a lordship over their children because they created them. And so they can I'm kind following. of set down these diktats to their children. And unfortunately, children get caught up into some bizarre behavior because of it. Absolutely. I agree with you. I think that children don't have the opportunity to voice their opinion because they don't have, they haven't had the ability to critically think because they've had their parents indoctrinating them since they were like two years old. Yeah. I, yeah. I a lot of by the time they're like 15 because they don't know how to critically think and how to think aside. Yeah. Just, you know, it is. And that's just what's that. I mean, I don't think it's bad if parents and children talk together about politics or whatever, but parents should be able to have the right to respect their children's opinions and not deplore them for whatever they do their youth or do their life and their spirits. I think that's not specific. I think that's wrong. And I really hold that when I have children, I will not do that same thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, so there's really two levels of this. But I need to say, at the end of the day, I don't think this... I think maybe for the, the, the critics on Twitchy, it was about abortion. But for me and you here, the real issue is not abortion. What the real issue is is two things. The indoctrination of children, no matter what the ideas are. But also, there's. let me bring up what that sign said again. It said, if I wanted the government in my womb, I'd fuck a senator. And there is a three-year-old holding that sign. Number one, does she even understand what abortion is? Does she know what a womb is? And fucking a senator. This is just insanity. This parent, these parents have taken it too far. Yeah. I but, mean, it's not fair. That's why, as a parent, you're not you're not allowing your children to critically think. The child is too young to be able to consent to whatever you're telling them. They have they don't have the ability to critically analyze what you're saying. 
They don't have the ability to develop what they're saying because they're parenting what you believe, and that's yes. not fair. You're imposing yourself on them, and you're not letting them be independent from yeah. you. That's I, just like not good in the future at all, to be honest. Absolutely. Like you need to let your children have their independence and say and think however they want. Yeah. And you need to respect it. Yeah, and I can tell you from my experience, you know, if for a while I was very concerned with wanting my parents to agree with me. So I would change my opinions to theirs. This was when I was 12, 13, 14, maybe 15. And, um, you know, in some ways I was headed on that path of becoming an ideologue. But, you know, circumstances prevailed where I kind of broke off and became independent and started thinking for myself. And I have, I have faith that these children can too, but at the same time, it makes it that much harder, you know? Because these types of ideas, they stay with you years after. And they inhibit, you know, your ability to do things. I mean, what if one of these girls in the future, you know, um, th that she has to go through a, an abortion for whatever reason? And what if at the end of the day, she just hates herself because of it, because of this early indoctrination? You know, it's or, okay. or whether she comes to just think that it's like nothing, you know, it goes on both sides. But, but yeah, so I, I you know, I, I, I bring up this issue and I thought this to pull from Twitchy because this is really an outlier. So I do not, I do not think this is the norm among um, pro-choice protesting families. I don't think it's the norm. I've never seen an example no, of this. I, but, I mean, the norm though is that, I've seen parents, though, no, that, not just on abortion, but on embarrassing, yeah. bringing their children to protest and have them hold these horrific signs that are incredibly, you know, racist, offensive, and yeah. such an offensive in some manner. Yeah. No matter what side of the political scale, yes. I've seen horrible things, and it's like, it makes me sick. Yeah, why, why would you do that to use children? I mean, Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, it, this isn't really something that I think has, this incident does not have nationwide significance, but it is a good touchstone, a good conversation opener, a good icebreaker to talk about um, parental attitudes of control and indoctrination. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. I just, I just don't, I think this makes me reinforce what I don't want to do with my children. Yeah, I mean, if anything, you know, the, you know, you can only be blamed if you do not learn from the mistakes of other people. Absolutely, you absolutely. Know? I think you're responsible for how your children turn out in that yeah. kind of respect and sense that this is what you did. Now you have to own up to it. And, you know, this just kind of distilled whatever um, these kind of control tendencies are in American parenting because there are few issues more uh, with more extreme views on either side than abortion. And there are a few issues that can make people enraged besides abortion. I mean, that's pretty much, I mean, that's pretty much number one, I would think. It's not so much important for me. It's not really something I think about, but I don't really have a position either way, but... You know, whatever. Right. I, mean, I mean, people are very passionate. After my friend got pregnant, I remember I, mis I supported her on her decision. I personally am mixed on abortion, but I wanted to be there for her, and I would have done anything for her at that point. Yeah. I wanted her to be well informed and to make whatever decision that she wanted. Yeah. I think it depends on each person. Personally, yeah. I would either get, if I got pregnant right now at this moment, I would either have an abortion or adoption because I'm not ready to be a mother and I have no ability to take care of my child. Yeah. And I, I think it's unfair to have a child when I'm not there. Yeah. Mentally, emotionally, or physically. Yeah. I don't think it's fair. And I want my child to have a good life. And I can't provide for him or her the life that I would want. Yeah. So it would be better to either to just not let it happen. I just feel it's fair. I'm, you know, I'm, I want, I want so much more than, you know, what I have now for them. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And it's, you know, it's, it's a hard reality, but it's something that in the end you probably have to come to terms with is sometimes some women, you know, no matter what, will get abortions, whether they're legal or not. Absolutely. I think it, making it illegal um, just like making gay marriage legal, people will still do it. I don't think that, you know, just like making drugs illegal, people, making it illegal makes it like to smoke in your food complex. Makes them, people, maybe, people want to stick it out more mm -hmm. because there's this illicit quality to it. Yeah, and you know, things like when talking about drug and alcohol policy, I really am a believer of the forbidden fr fruit syndrome, which basically, because these things are banned, because they, you know, children don't have exposure to them before, um, they can easily be 
um, you know, led into situations like parties or social gatherings where people are using a substance. They have no idea what it is. They've never, you know, seen it. They don't know anything about it. And, you know, I was shocked. I was telling you about a series of videos created by the Church of Scientology on YouTube that were little vignettes about drug addiction. And I was shocked because they, they would ask for every video, for every interviewee, um, what age did you begin to abuse the drug? And it was always 12, 13, 14, almost consistently. I was shocked. But this drug addiction, you know, if you have an addictive personality, that comes out early, you know? So it's important to not have, you know, whatever forbidden fruit draw there is, we need to not normalize, not glamorize, but just expose these things. We need to talk about it, basically. Absolutely, but the problem is that we don't talk about it often, unfortunately, in society. Yeah, well, well, we've gotten a little bit off topic, so let's get back on track here. I have an article from NPR, and it's talking about the Democrats' um, strategy to have electoral victory in Texas. So I don't know if you remember, but there was a lot of conjecture in the 2008 election um, that... For the first time in a long time, Texas would um, place its electoral votes for the Democratic candidate. Now, that did not end up happening, I don't think. Um, however, it did get close enough that people were willing to entertain it as a possibility. And, you know, a branch of my family is from Texas, and I will say it's pretty unconscionable that that would ever happen, but demographically... The shift of Latinos into many areas in um, Texas, these pollsters say, demographically, it's unavoidable that there will be a Democratic majority in the future. So this is very interesting. The, um, the article, you know, it does cite the, the fast-growing Latino population in Texas as the origin of this. But, of course, this demographic, however inevitable they may say it is, the Republican candidates have won... 100 statewide elections in a row. So that is an incredible streak, you know, that's probably many decades. Um, and, and if you look at the Texas Republican Party, you know, at the helm of it are Tea Party leaders like Ted Cruz and John Cornyn. And, you know, Tea Party leaders have, you know, had, had control wrested from them in many areas of the rest of the country. Um, since 2010, um, it, it's gone back to, you know, control in many state parties has gone back to more moderate establishment um, types. But in Texas, it does remain a Tea Party state. Um, so you kind of have these two um, tendencies, the demographics on one side, but the strong conservative tradition of Texas on the other side. And then, you know, you have pollsters also, you know, contradicting themselves, coming out and saying, well, you know, it's almost um, inevitable that Latinos will become the majority. But on the other hand, um, Hispanic participation in um, elections is very low for whatever reason. So, I mean, it's just, you know, especially in 2012, it was very low. So it's just like sort of like these contradict each you know, each other, and who knows what's going to happen. I mean, do you foresee a future where um, Texas could be a blue state? Absolutely, yeah, with the influx of Latinos, um, especially because outside of Cubans, most Latino, Latinos, Latino Americans, um, recent Latin, Amer uh, Latin immigrants from Latin America, are very liberal. They're, they're socially conservative, on certain aspects as far as traditional family structure goes, mm -hmm. but as far as economic policy goes, they always, they're not like 70, 30 Democratic Party. Yeah, I, I see been. that happening. But I feel, but I know that um, with the Catholic, I, I believe that just like with African Americans, who are a lot of religious too, I believe economic policy, economic concerns trump um, social conservatism. And, and economically, um, they are leftist for the most part. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, you're correct. I mean, they, a lot of Latino immigrants come from war-torn nations, but they come from nations where there have been strong, suppressed, um, but very long heritage heritages of leftist movements, and they bring that legacy to the United States. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. I think they're disenfranchised, so I, think, I believe that they do take um, advantages of whatever 
I mean, the Democrat Party offers them the economic advantage we desire, the, yeah. better, the economic, um, the better opportunities, the economic um, ability to improve their life. I think that's that's very attractive to many yeah. who suffer so much who've had nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, that trumps, that supersedes any, you can, I think supersedes any conservative concern thing they have yeah. as far as social mores go. Yes. Yes, I agree. Um, so, I guess that, the, you know, I could see it going both ways. You know, there is compelling evidence. Um, I don't particularly, um, I'm not hedging my bets on anything. I don't really care. I know that there are very conservative viewpoints in Texas. I know that it has a large legacy of racism, of slavery, of lynching. You know, it used to be a part of Mexico, but, you know, now it's the United States. And, you know, people are outraged when Latino culture penetrates the border, which is absurd. But, <laughs> um, blame the Pasadena in Mexico. If you're going to blame it, I think, blame the... Co- of course, you can't blame geography, but my gosh, like, blame the fact that we have a very close border with Mexico. And and I think a lot of... People don't want to admit it, but people don't want to see the benefits of Latin culture to society. Yeah. But that's just their own racism. Yeah. I mean, and I, I, it's just, if even if you just, bring, you know, you're a history major, you're studying history. If you just, I mean, I don't know if, if, if most. I mean, honestly, don't, don't rely on me on history because I, I did my major because I was allowed to do research and write and read, and I love doing all three. Not that I know a lot of things about history specifically. Okay. Okay. So maybe I won't call you our historian then. <laughs> no, not yet. But so, but, but, you know, I mean. We conquered, annexed half of Mexico in the Mexican-American War, and that included Absolutely. Texas. You know, so it's just kind of weird. It's always struck me as very odd, ever since I was a young kid, that when I came back to America, when I was conscious and old enough to understand what was going on, and, you know, people would talk about Latino immigrants disparagingly, especially, you know, in the South and in the West. And it's just, I don't know. I mean, historically... Are you, who is surprised that Latino culture is seeping through this non-existent border? I mean, it, it, I don't know, you know? I don't know. I mean, this is, this is something, I think, I don't know why people should be surprised, but then again, I'm always surprised by what Amer- the ignorance of many people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, and it shouldn't surprise us. I haven't been, see- I haven't been yet surprised that. I mean, I'm, so, I'm not surprised by the ignorance. I'm just surprised what people really don't know. I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, so, um, and also, you know, that Republican, uh, Texas Republican Party that has won 100 elections in a row, you know, they control the legislature. And they are introducing measures to um, redistrict. And they're... they're redistricting in a way that these these Latino constituencies will be the least powerful and the least consequential voting blocks that they can. And that is sad, but it is one of the few, um, I think, instances of political corruption in our society that is so openly viewed. I mean, people don't even try to hide. I mean, on the last ballot, we had a horrific um, proposal to redistrict by Demo- it was coming from the Democratic Party of Maryland, uh-huh. and and it made no sense. It was. But I don't understand redistricting in general. Redistricting is all the trying to get elected. Democratic Party must be corrupt if they think. I'm so glad that that did not pass. And even though Barack Obama did win, I'm glad that the Democrats did did not get their way on the ticket on that, at least in our state. Because, I mean, even Democrats. We're, we're talking about how ridiculous this seemed. I mean, it was, I know probably um, not everyone who theoretically in our pool of zero listeners um, know about Maryland geography, but there was this re- proposed redistricting plan would um, lump Baltimore City at, in one district that includes also Baltimore County and then two counties to the west. I mean, these, but it wasn't even whole counties either. It was slivers of counties. I mean, it's just the reason for this. It's just so blatantly just devoid of any practical application. There was no need, in, in I think, most of these cases for this gerrymandering. Absolutely, but I don't try to understand politics anymore. <laughs> politics. Well, you know, politics, politics is politics, but... Um, 
And then finally, well, let's wrap up about this. The last thing it says about the gerrymandering is, you know, demographic changes can only be held back through creative cartography, gerrymandering, for so long. You know, at the end of the day, they cannot stave off change. It's inevitable. However, the Koch brothers, very famous um, um, uh, funders of conservative causes in America, have pledged, pledged $8 million to the Texas Republican Party um, to to do two things, to support this uh, redistricting uh, measures. Do you think it would ever work? Uh, you know, the Koch brothers have pledged $8 million to the Texas uh -huh. Republican Party to try to bring, to attract Latinos into the fold. Do you think that would no. work? No, I don't know. Money will not do anything. Party platform, party ideology has to change. Yeah, and they're so... Money doesn't do anything. They're not Cuban. Yeah. Like, I think we're like, yes. We're like going off of like one uh -huh. ethnic group. We're just assuming that everyone will fall through. That's yeah. Like They're not going to. Yeah. When you bring up Fidel Castro and communism, that doesn't resonate with no, any, absolutely any not. expatriates like, except Cubans. We're, we're, that's why that's an issue connecting with Marco Rubio because he's Cuban and he's privileged. Yeah. Yes. Yes. American is privileged, and he does not connect with the average farm worker from Mexico. N not at America. all. And you know, outlets, mainstream outlets, and outlets like Fox News, which pretty much. Some have said, to use a Fox trick, you know, some have said that they're, they basically function as a mouthpiece for GOP talking points. You know, they equate Ted Cruz with Latinos, and they think by an elevation of Ted Cruz, they pretty much just assume that Latinos will go along with it of any stripe. But Ted Cruz does not speak for all Latinos. Absolutely. He doesn't even speak Spanish that well. <laughs> No, you speak Spanish like better than well. Ted Cruz. He had, he had, like, a debate with, like, a white dude who spoke better Spanish than he did. Oh, the God. White dude lost. Oh, God. Won. And we supported Ted Cruz because he's a Republican, and apparently he's not as, he does not have a, he has enough Latin cred, as in, like, he, I believe he's a, I think his family is also Cuban, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but he doesn't, he's not, he's not too Latin because he doesn't speak Spanish fluently. Yeah. Yes. So I mean, it's like Latin, to the token Latin. Like we have a token Indian, Bobby Jindal, the Republican Well, it's party. like, I mean, it's like, I mean, this is probably very controversial, but it's like he's the Uncle Tom of Latinos in politics. Absolutely. You know, and Fox at first, you know, the uh, I mean, if you were paying attention to the media the day after the last presidential election, um... You know, Fox was going crazy, but also CNN, I think, too, about that, you know, the Republicans, they, it's like they immediately drew the conclusion that Republicans lost the election um, because they were not able to attract enough Latino voters. Um, and so they immediately began to sort of idolize Ted Cruz. But now that there is substantive um, changes to immigration law that are being proposed, um, Fox News and conservative media has totally backtracked. They've turned against Cruz, and they're really trying to frame, his, frame him as like a pariah for supporting immigration reform. So it's all bizarre. It's very complicated. So we should stop there for tonight. But this was the, the conversation and just the ease. I mean, you're really a natural. I am, I am really... Thank you. I'm so, I'm this, so happy. Well, I'll just let you know from my perspective, you did an amazing job. Thank you. you Thank you. So many ideas that were brought in, and you speak articulately. I am glad to have you as a panelist, and I'll definitely bring you back. But um, absolutely, that's fine. So, any last words that you want to say to anybody, and if you want to, um, anybody to know how to contact you? Oh um, uh, yes, please. If you want to contact me, I have two things. Well, I haven't. Well, you can contact me. Oh my! I have. I'll have an email address. Just. I'll find some email address I can connect specifically for the podcast. Yes, that's a good idea. Good idea, Elizabeth. Um, yes, because so, I just realized I need, to make a new, I need to make a new email address. Yeah, because I would love it if people would... I would love to hear people's thoughts on this, their contributions, and what they think of this show. Absolutely. Um, I'll have an email address. Um, my phone number is pretty private. I can't do that. But an email address, I, I, I'm like always connected to my phone, so I will check it pretty much every hour. Awesome. Great. I will respond as soon as possible. So you want to? So by the next time we do this, um, we'll be working on that email. Um, yes, absolutely. I should have one up by tonight. And if you guys want to contact me again, my name is Jacob Music on Facebook. I am the only Jacob Music probably there. Um, it's Jacob with a K, so it's J A K O B, 
and then M-U-S-I-C-K. And I do have a hyphenated last name on Facebook, but if you want to contact me and add me as a friend or follow me there, that would be wonderful. Again, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Elizabeth, for being a great panelist and being one of my best friends, okay? You're welcome. It's always a pleasure, and you're always one of my best friends. It's always a pleasure to talk to you about all these different topics. I love hearing your voice, Yes. I love hearing your opinion on things. It's always a pleasure. We'll have to do this stuff more often. Awesome. I'm always here. Thank you so and much. And for everyone else, too. Yes, okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Get... No, no, but... This is wrong. Get rid of all this. I don't want to see all this. It's making me nervous. Okay. Um, and the, the word the is spelled wrong in the prompter. No, what, are you ta- what are you doing? If one more person opens that door, I'm going to nail that door shut during the show. Who is that hovering in the hallway? Opening the door and hovering. I don't want to hover. Jeez. They're hovering and opening and closing. All right, all right. Don't hover at me. God. And every time you flip the screen from an element to the monitor, I get some uh, Hispanic-looking man on the screen. I don't know who he is, but he's been on my prompter the whole night. Oh, my God. This is a train wreck. Okay. Why is this new tonight, guys? It's not new tonight. He, g- he gave this... No, no, no. But he gave the speech yesterday. That's the Fox way of doing things.